Mr. Panda, I'm Dr. Arushi Jain. I'm the policy director of the Bharti Institute of Public Policy and the course coordinator of this program. Uh, it's a true privilege to have you here as one of our inaugural uh, speakers during these uh, virtual sessions that we are having for the ninth batch of Advanced Management Program in Public Policy. Uh, you know, we've had the privilege of listening to you earlier uh, with the previous batches, uh, but to introduce uh, uh, very briefly the batch in the program. Um, so this uh, batch of advanced management program of public policy uh, is a very, very uh, healthy and a good mix of people from very diverse backgrounds, uh, almost 60, 60, 65 people uh, coming from both the public and the private sector. Uh, from the government, uh, we have officers from different services uh, and this is a part of the one year long term domestic training for civil servants in India. It's a hybrid program where uh, participants come uh, for residencies and uh, in person interactions for 40 days in a year. Uh, but the rest of the learning is online, just like the session we are having right now. So uh, we start, um, you know, with the program every year in the month of July, and uh, we call it as the digital jumpstart module. Uh, while we do some introductory sessions on public policy with the participants and, uh, and you know, um, introduce uh, various aspects of governance and public policy to the, to the participants of the program. The other half of our uh, cohort comes from the, the private sector and the developmental sector. Uh, and uh, this is that's why this program is very unique because the focus of the program a lot is on peer learning from each other. So with that, a very brief introduction. Uh, it's a true privilege once again to have you here with us. Uh, uh, I am sure everyone knows you uh, very well, but I'll still uh, request uh, Nimisha Jain, our research manager, uh, to just very briefly formally introduce you to the participants as we begin. Good evening, everyone. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, Bejan Jay Panda sir is a national vice president of the Bharatiya Janata Party. He's a fifth time member of Parliament of India, elected twice each to the Rajya Sabha and the Lok Sabha from Kendrapada, Odisha. He had been a member of the BJP National Core Group to articulate and communicate the rationale for amending Article 370 of the Indian Constitution relating to Jammu and Kashmir. Sir has also held the post of BJP organizational prabhari that is in charge for the states of Assam and Delhi, as well as the National Mahila Morcha. He was also the chairman of the high level expert committee formed by Government of India for restructuring the National Cadet Corps. In his earlier corporate career, Jay Panda Sir was active in industry organizations like the Confederation of Indian Industry. Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry and the International Chromium Development Association. Sir was awarded the Bharat Asmita National Award for his best parliamentary practices by the Honorable Chief Justice of India in the year 2008. As a parliamentarian, he has been a member of many important committees like the Parliamentary Standing Committees on Finance, Energy, Urban Development and Consultation committee for the Ministry of Finance, Economic Development, Education, Health, Information Technology and Data Privacy, as well as matters concerning his home states of Russia. So often participates in national television discussions and write poetry pieces in newspapers. So we are truly honored to have you with us today. Thank you. Dr. Jane and uh, the distinguished participants of this cohort. I'm uh, very happy to be speaking again. I have, speak, I have spoken, as Dr. Jane mentioned, uh, to earlier cohorts, but I was taking a quick glance at the participant profile. And I must say that uh, it is indeed very impressive. Compliments on keeping on improving the program and getting this level of participation. Uh, I think it speaks very well of this program and also uh, the kind of leaders that are being created in both the public and uh, private sector uh, through programs such as this. So I'm going to slightly broaden 
the topic that had been assigned to me, which was uh, the evolution of uh, citizens' advocacy for public health and uh, transparency and accountability in government. And these are areas that I have worked on extensively, and I will cover them. But to put them in context, I'm going to speak about uh, uh, the work in progress that India is and where we stand today, how we have transformed in the last decade, and what the roadmap is going forward. And in that context, I will speak about uh, my experiences in citizens' advocacy for health, especially malnutrition, and about uh, transparency in governance. So it's no secret that in the last 10 years, uh, there's been a dramatic change in the perception of the world about India. Uh, we've been there before. Uh, in, on certain earlier occasions, India had been perceived as this important country that deserved attention. Uh, but on many occasions, we seem to miss the bus. Uh, this happened when we became independent, uh, the single largest country to come out of colonial rule. Uh, nobody believed around the world that India could remain a democracy. And we have disproved that uh, year after year, election after election, decade after decade. You know, even in the last decade, uh, there are many people, many, many people who have complained about the lack of democracy in India. But I think the last election, the recent election itself, confirms that democracy is very alive and well and healthy in India. And there is no uh, guaranteed outcome in any democracy. The Indian voters, the Indian public, have demonstrated their wisdom repeatedly over the decades. And they have done so again this time and contradicted many predictions, many analysis. Uh, but in this last decade, I, I can speak confidently about the world's image of India because in my uh, now a quarter century in politics, uh, I, I earlier spent 19 years in parliament and now I've again uh, been elected to parliament uh, just now. I've spent uh, a lot of time on track to diplomacy. Uh, I have participated in uh, something approaching a hundred track two roundtable discussions with various nations, uh, which involved Indian parliamentarians. And I've had the privilege of leading the Indian delegation on more than 50 occasions on such track two delegations. Uh, for uh, These are not the junkets that one hears about. These are the ones where you spend a week in intense discussions around a round table. Uh, and uh, with, with lots of exposure, with similar discussions in, in the US, uh, in uh, uh, China, in uh, Japan, in Asian countries, in Pakistan. Uh, I, I can tell you that the world's image has transformed. Uh, the world sees India in a different light than it has traditionally seen. One reason, of course, is that India has uh, arguably the most vibrant economy in the world today. Now, for a number of years, I think now six or seven years in a row, India has been the fastest growing large economy. And this is particularly notable because it is during this period that the world economy and the major economic powers of the world have seen major challenges. We've seen a pandemic. Uh, we've seen the recovery from the pandemic be very slow around the world. And it is during this time that India has shone and uh, we, we rapidly keep uh, edging past many other nations. Uh, we went past the United Kingdom as the fifth largest economy last year. We will soon be uh, going past Japan to become the third largest econo uh, economy, uh, I'm sorry, the fourth largest, and, and then the third largest when we, uh, sorry, Germany to become the fourth largest and crossing Japan to become the third largest in the uh, next two or three years. So this is undoubtedly the major reason why the world sees India in a different light. But it's not the only reason. I mean, India has also proved um, 
less reticent in dealing with the rest of the world. So one of the consequences of our colonial heritage was that we, I, I define this as a transition from diffidence to confidence. So uh, the, the post-independent India for many decades was very diffident, unsure of ourselves in dealing with the rest of the world. Uh, that's why we created barriers to our economy. We created barriers to all, all kinds of restrictions. But uh, starting from the economic liberalization of the 1990s, Gradually, there is a new India, there is a new Bharat that has developed with a great deal of self-confidence. And the diaspora has played a very important part in this because the Indian diaspora now is the largest around the world. And it is one that is, has been almost universally successful in virtually any country that you go to, from uh, African nations to the US, to Europe, uh, to other nations. The Indian diaspora there locally has, in a very short period, become the most affluent social group in each of these nations. And more than that, they have become admired and accepted into these societies. Uh, Indians are welcome in uh, all of these countries for being productive citizens, for contributing to the societies where they are. All of these have transformed India's image. And I can speak with personal experience. I'm somebody who lived almost a decade outside the country. I studied and worked outside the country when I was uh, much younger. And the kind, of, uh, uh, the kind of reception one gets today when you approach an immigration officer in any country, or you talk to a taxi driver in any country, compared to 25, 30 years ago, there's a world of difference. Now, I can go on and on, but uh, I think there's a general acceptance. Uh, uh, you know, in India's foreign policy is much more vigorous. Uh, I want to cite one example. In, uh, in all of these track two delegations that I participated uh, in, starting from the year 2000 till about 2010, 12, 14, around that time, uh, one kept hearing, especially from Asian nations, that why doesn't India become more uh, forthcoming? Why doesn't India take more of a leadership role? And again, I, I put this down to the diffidence that we had, the lack of self-confidence that we had uh, from the experience of the colonial era. Now, that has changed a lot. The kind of uh, role India plays today uh, is in concert with the most important nations in the world. Uh, for example, in just two, or two and a half months, we're going to have the 24th Malabar exercise. These are defense military exercises in uh, the Indian Ocean uh, with uh, Japan and other Asian nations. Uh, these are things that up until about 10, a dozen years ago were not very much conceivable. Um, the kind of uh, exercises we do in rescuing Indian citizens who are in difficulty in other parts of the world has become actually, uh, uh, the talk of the town is a way of putting it because this is something I keep uh, hearing from uh, my counterparts, legislators and politicians and business people in other nations when we, uh, when we travel or talk to them. Now, um, in defense as well, India has transformed. So if you turn the clock back to 2017, when uh, we we first had a significant Chinese aggression after a gap of almost 40 years, uh, and uh, the India stood up to it. This was in the Northeast. And then in 2020, you had a resurgence of Chinese aggression, which actually saw the first bloodshed after nearly half a century with China. Uh, this was observed very closely uh, by many other nations and in some of these track to round table discussions, I heard a great deal of admiration expressed uh, because China has been aggressive with many nations, not just India. China has this kind of a relationship with uh, Vietnam, with Indonesia, with Malaysia, with Philippines, and many nations look upon India as uh, 
uh, not exactly a white knight, but as an emerging nation that uh, is benign. Whereas the growth of China has often been seen as hostile, the growth of India is often seen as benign. I mean, there are some exceptions, of course. Uh, a country like Pakistan would not see India's rights as benign. China has its own reservations. Uh, maybe an occasional Turkey or Malaysia, but you know, the vast majority of the nations see India in different light. Now, if you look domestically also, uh, we have transformed quite a lot. We have literally raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. This is a feat that was achieved only by China in the last, uh, you know, in, in this number of people to be lifted out of poverty uh, within one generation, within one lifetime, has only been done by China before. And that was from uh, 1980 till now. Any other country that became developed took longer time and lifted fewer people out of poverty. You saw the example of the US from the late 19th century onwards, and you've seen other nations. But the, this is the dramatic change that has taken place uh, in India. Uh, but all said and done, despite all these great achievements, and there's a great deal of feel-good factor that we feel uh, whenever we talk, especially to people outside India, including our diaspora, including foreigners, and many in India also take pride with this development. The fact remains that we are a work in progress, which I said at the beginning of my talk. And that should be no surprise because no country in the world, especially the largest country in the world in terms of population with such diversity, can simply snap its fingers and then turn things around. It takes a long time. It takes a generation or two. And that's why when the national leadership has set its sights on 2047, which will be the 100th anniversary of independence, that's a very logical time frame to talk about turning India around from a developing nation into a developed nation. So where we are today is we are at the, still at an entry level or uh, slightly more than that of what are called middle income nations. Uh, yes, we are still a developing nation, but there has been a transition in the last quarter century where we have gone from a nation that took aid from other nations to a nation which today primarily gives aid to other nations. Uh, I remember the first time uh, I noticed with a great deal of pride when uh, India donated a small sum to the US about 15 years ago when they had a major hurricane uh, in, uh, in the southern part of their country. Uh, we had also done similar things when we had the tsunami in Asia. But today it is a regular feature. In fact, post-COVID pandemic, uh, India has done very significant work in uh, providing financial assistance to especially to our neighbors to Bangladesh, to Sri Lanka, to Nepal. And uh, over a longer period, <coughs> India has been the second largest aid donor to Afghanistan, second only to the US. Uh, and we are talking many billions of dollars here. So there has been this transformation. But like I said, we are still only uh, at the lower levels of a middle income nation. Now, even then, uh, even at the lower levels of per capita income of a middle nation, a middle income nation, the vast size of India means that the overall impact of India's economy, of uh, India's uh, uh, clout has become dramatically different. And that is why India today is uh, uh, seen as part of the most important nations which sort of decide on global policies, which tackle global challenges. So although we are not part of the G7, but we are uh, a regular invitee and we participate, uh, the G7 itself has lost some of its logic because uh, they were the seven largest economies uh, among uh, democracies. And India has already gone beyond the, uh, the smaller economies in the G7. And I remember going back about 15 odd years when uh, uh, there was talk about the reform of the G20 
and the G7 into a G9. But G20 reform has happened, and India's presidency of the G20 last year was quite a phenomenon. The, the G20 has never seen anything quite like it, because prior to India's presidency, the scale of G20 activities used to be uh, four or five events spread over a year. Uh, China was uh, an outlier. It had 12 major events uh, when it presided over the G20. India had 200. So the ambition and the scale at which we are dealing with the rest of the community of nations around the world has also changed very dramatically. But the hard facts are that when we look at per capita income, Again and again, we keep coming back to the reality that at something like two and a half thousand dollars per person, we are still only an entry level middle income country. And that means we have a lot of developmental challenges still ahead of us, despite having raised hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, despite uh, having made dramatic progress, uh, we have a lot of work cut out for us. And that is why the Roadmap uh, should be seen in the context of where can we reach in 2047. Of course, uh, every year, every five years, one has to make significant progress to get there. And the two areas that I mentioned that are my uh, listed topic is citizen advocacy uh, for uh, public health, especially malnutrition, and uh, transparency in government. Malnutrition has been a scourge of modern India for a long time. Uh, I mean, if you look at some of the biggest famines in uh, modern history, going back the past couple of hundred years, uh, from the 19th century to around the time of our independence to subsequently after that, uh, we have seen very dire situations in India. When I first became a member of parliament in the year 2000, uh, every year in my home state, there used to be hundreds of people that used to die from malnutrition. And uh, I remember having to discuss this on television discussions and other contexts, and it, it was uh, quite something. Now today, in my home state, which remains one of the poorer parts of India, although it has made a lot of progress, a single malnutrition death stands out and becomes a big scandal. Uh, it, it happens very rarely, but when it does happen, it becomes a major scandal. And that's the kind of progress that we have made. But malnutrition is not just about starvation and about deaths. Today, we may have put starvation behind us as a nation, but malnutrition is something that hasn't yet uh, gone, although we have made a lot of progress. And I want to talk a little bit about that. So the common misconception is that malnutrition is about getting adequate calories, uh, is, uh, is exactly that, it's a misconception. Malnutrition can have, uh, many of you are of course aware of it, those of you who are from uh, government service, you may have served in some of these uh, uh, ministries or some of these uh, functions. Uh, a simple thing like iodizing of salt, without which we were having cretinism and IQ deficiency. I remember the challenge to this uh, 20 odd years ago when it was still a subject of debate in parliament arguing with many of my colleagues who had a different viewpoint. You know, the argument 20 years ago was that what will happen to the small cottage industry of people making salt uh, who can't iodize it? How will they compete with Tata salt? And that was the kind of debate that we used to have. But today, iodizing is, uh, is a fait accompli, if you will. And uh, the very clear connection between uh, iodine deficiency and IQ uh, issues uh, has to a very large extent been addressed. But of course, there are many other issues connected with uh, malnutrition. Um, a large number of Indian girls and young women have uh, anemia. And this is related to uh, several factors. The, the calories itself are not enough. Uh, 
a large number of uh, the younger generation in India, uh, especially in urban India, but you're beginning to see this uh, phenomenon in rural India also, it, uh, are obese. And these are not just uh, rich kids. These are middle class kids. These are even lower income children. And the reason is the calories are coming from very different kind of sources. You know, you can eat a thousand calories from kurkure. And that will lead to a very different outcome than eating a thousand calories from a traditional wholesome meal uh, that, uh, that we are used to. Uh, there are other aspects of malnutrition, uh, which, uh, which are also related to the health system, access to the health system, and also cultural issues. Uh, I talked about young women being anemic. Uh, one of the cultural aspects among uh, some Indian households in some parts of the country, uh, uh, in fact, many parts of the country, is that women eat last. And uh, even young women, even young girls who may be school students in their families uh, will be helping with the cooking and serving and they will eat after all the men and the boys have eaten. Uh, this leads to uh, an imbalance, in, a gender imbalance in terms of the access to uh, a balanced diet sometimes. Um, another aspect of malnutrition is not related to food at all. Uh, the open defecation that we have seen in India for a very long time used to lead to different kinds of infections uh, which unless proper deworming was done in time uh, would have a lingering uh, malignant effect on kids. So these are different aspects of malnutrition that people don't realize because they think of malnutrition as just having a deficiency of food and, and starvation. I was very proud to, in fact, one of the, uh, one of the uh, proudest things, uh, uh, one of the things I'm proudest of, of having worked in public life is on this initiative called uh, the Citizens Alliance Against Malnutrition. So this was started uh, uh, about 15 years ago. And uh, it involved parliamentarians from across the political spectrum, from different parties, and including government and opposition. And the basic gentleman's understanding was, that at least let us keep the issue of malnutrition unpoliticized. Can we work on this together without politicizing the issue? And we made a lot of progress. Uh, we had to partner with UNICEF, and uh, we made a lot of field visits. Uh, many of us learned a lot about uh, these aspects and we have had discussions at the national level, with, uh, at the prime ministerial level, chief ministerial level, at uh, uh, the earlier planning commission and Niti Aayog level. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of how priorities um, uh, matter. So at the NDC meetings where the Prime Minister uh, discusses with uh, the Chief Ministers, and there are various topics, and you might have 15 items, 20 items on the agenda, uh, rarely does uh, the issue of malnutrition, or rarely did it used to in the past, the issue of malnutrition get top priority. You know, the top priority might be um, dealing with the scourge of naxalism in certain states, uh, dealing with uh, economic assistance to states. And the, you know, the issue of nutrition parity uh, would either not be on the agenda or would be so far down that it wouldn't really get addressed. So some of the things that we did, and by the way, it was not just parliamentarians, it, it was the Citizens Alliance Against Malnutrition also included certain celebrities from Bollywood, from the sports world, and many citizens who volunteered to help raise awareness about the topic and to put uh, sort of a citizenry pressure on the system to respond to these issues. Uh, those of you who are from the civil services uh, would have seen, a, I wouldn't say a whole scale change, but I'm sure you would have seen some uh, changes. Uh, some of the recommendations which were accepted by many governments was to um, uh, to keep track of district level malnutrition figures and then accordingly reward the civil servants associated with it 
and use that in their annual evaluations. Uh, uh, you have seen, for example, you've seen uh, uh, a very major program of the government called aspirational districts and focus on, on transforming asp aspirational districts. Uh, it should be no surprise that aspirational districts and the malnutrition map are uh, pretty close overlap because all of these aspirational districts uh, would undoubtedly, almost certainly, uh, they had uh, malnutrition issues. Malnutrition, uh, addressing malnutrition also involves um, fortification. Now, uh, there are many arguments regarding fortification, but on balance, although we received some pushback, on balance, the general consensus was that, uh, you know, there, there, there's, there, there are different ways to tackle um, deficiencies in the diets of people. Uh, one very mass scale movement that has happened, championed by the Prime Minister himself, is the championing of millets, which is a whole food compared to polished grains, which, uh, you know, your white rice and uh, white maida, uh, as an alternative to that, millets are going to have a transformational effect in the long term in the health because of the fiber and the nutrient, the nutrient density in, uh, in millets. But while that is an ongoing thing, the requirement of um, uh, fortification, I gave the example of uh, iodine fortification for salt, but uh, the idea of fortifi fortifying uh, rice, wheat, even milk with basic uh, vitamins uh, is, is a concept that has gained a great deal of acceptance. Now, again, there have been you know, pros and cons, some groups argue against it. But the general consensus has been that it should be done and it has largely been done. And those of you who are interested in this, I think there's a very good article in the current week's Economist, which gives a, a good overview of how uh, nutrition uh, equity is being dealt with in India and what more needs to be done. So my example was... Uh, uh, about how the citizenry can participate, and particularly in a democracy. Now, we, we know the no democracy is a perfect democracy, but in a democracy, there is a greater likelihood of getting the system to reorient if you can get enough people to come together. And it doesn't have to be only celebrities, it doesn't have to be only politicians who agree to work together, cutting across party lines. Uh, citizenry groups can make such a difference and we, have, we can go into many other examples. Now, I want to come to the last part of my talk and then uh, we'll open up for discussion and which is about transparency in governance. One of the benefits of having democracy and, you know, we, we must not underestimate the achievements of India as a democracy because if you think about it, something that should uh, uh, we should consider with humility is that the Republic of India is not only the, it's the largest democracy that humankind has ever seen. In the history of humankind, there has never been anything like this. Such a huge gathering of people uh, who come together to decide their fate uh, in electing the kind of government they would like uh, and, and it's not to be taken lightly. Now, democracy has shortcomings because democracy is not a system for speedy decision making. Uh, there are, you know, there are always people who will have envy of a country like China, where only five people decide the fate of the country. Because their highest committee, uh, headed by the president of that nation, is only nine people. So if five of them are in agreement, any policy can be instituted. Now in India, no policy can be implemented by five people, not even by 50 people, not even by 500 or even 5,000 people. Uh, it requires a great deal of buy-in, a great deal of uh, selling of the ideas uh, to make policies change and to uh, keep them uh, to, to, to keep transforming them. I mean, the greatest example you can see was in the farm laws. Now, the farm laws were something that every party except the Communist Party had endorsed. They had endorsed it in writing, 
they had put it in their manifestos and yet uh, they had to be reversed because of uh, opposition. So the, there are differences between a democracy and uh, uh, a more authoritarian system of governance. But the democracy has on balance far more advantages because it has the ability to course correct. It has the ability to let off steam, which author more authoritarian systems don't. So I have seen this transformation because as I told you, uh, when I started my parliamentary career, whenever I was in Asian countries, I would hear a, a longing for India to take up a bigger role. But in Western countries, there was always a denigration of India. Oh, it's a chaotic democracy, can't get its act together, takes too long to come up with policies. China is much better. And you used to have the large corporates and other influential sections always batting for China. I personally noticed that changing around 2012 or so. And uh, ever since then, you've seen a gradual rise of concern against China because an authoritarian system, which can very quickly take some smart decisions, can also very quickly take some very bad decisions. And things can go bad uh, pretty quickly. And you're seeing that in China today. You've seen the collapse of the real estate segment uh, two years ago. And you are seeing the collapse of their banking segment uh, you know, uh, just recently, 14 banks have disappeared. They were bad banks. They had to be uh, merged into other banks. And uh, although we are slower, every any democracy is slower, uh, the principle that applies to the evolution uh, uh, of policies in a democracy is the proverbial hockey stick curve. In other words, it's not a steady state uh, improvement all the time. You can take a lot of time putting your building blocks in place. And once you reach a tipping point, then things can take off in a very sharp curve, the tradition, the proverbial hockey stick curve. And you're beginning to see that happening with India. We took decades to reiterate, confirm, establish thoroughly our democracy, our democratic systems. Uh, we have taken now more than 30 years in liberalizing our policies since 1991. And we did not liberalize them as fast as China did. When China liberalized its policies in the late 70s, when Deng Xiaoping took over from uh, Mao, in a matter of one or two years, they totally turned their economic system, they totally changed their attitudes, and they benefited from that because they had very high double-digit growth rates for more than 30 years uh, that has taken them to this position. But we are doing the catching up now in a, in a pretty, uh, I, I, I hesitate to say spectacular fashion, but in a very impressive manner, India is catching up. But the one thing that a democracy needs is, is openness and, and transparency. You know, it can be, openness and transparency can mean more than one thing. So for example, uh, we had these many legacy laws uh, many of which uh, have been discarded in recent times. Uh, those archaic laws, which are totally irrelevant to a 21st century uh, scenario, used to contribute to a lingering on of the Inspector Raj, rather than freeing up our uh, enterprises to be more entrepreneurial and to be more uh, free to pursue their own strategies. Uh, let's take, for example, the massive transformation in terms of government delivery services, direct benefits transfer, DBT. Now, I, I was a champion of DBT long before it became a fact of life over the past decade. Uh, this was from interacting with many economists, uh, such as uh, Avijit Banerjee, uh, le learning about how direct delivery of uh, benefits can bypass the leakages, can bypass uh, the inefficiencies of a system. And you've seen today lakhs of crores of rupees saved in terms of delivering government services. Uh, I, I've seen this myself. So, for example, when uh, the Aadhaar linkage 
to uh, school midday meals was being discussed some years ago. There was fierce resistance from certain sections. And as a member of parliament, I used to, you know, we conduct these quarterly Disha review meetings of uh, governmental schemes and as they are implemented. And I was a, I was a champion. I championed DBT for the following reason. Every scheme that I ever reviewed, I found very, very significant leakage. Now, the number of uniforms that would be paid for, the number of meals that would be paid for, the number of books that would be paid for, for uh, school children in, I'm talking about my district, my Lok Sabha district, which I represent. In every single instance, uh, any audit would show a large number of ghost students. Students who didn't exist, they were only on paper and there would be large billings for them. Uh, DBT takes care of that. Uh, DBT takes care of many other such uh, uh, deduplication of beneficiaries. And this is just one example of how transparency can work. Now, I will conclude my talk and we can explore any of these ideas or any of these issues or other issues in the uh, open discussion. I will... I, uh, I will conclude my discussion by saying that our administrative reform needs to go a lot further. Now, I know many of you are administrators, many of you are civil servants or from the public sector. Our administrators, on the one hand, are the finest brains that this country has because you pass through extremely competitive exams to get to these positions. But the system which was devised in an earlier era for uh, a certain set of priorities is facing challenges today in the 21st century, which has a totally different environment and totally different requirement of how, uh, how uh, policies are to be implemented and how challenges are to be tackled. Uh, so, Many ideas, like horizontal entry, for instance, in, uh, uh, in, in uh, the administration, was something that was put off for many years. It's today, I would call it at a pilot stage. There are um, lateral entry happening even at senior positions in government, but still not of a scale that happens in other large democracies. I'm just throwing this out because it's a thought that has support from many quarters. It also has opposition from many quarters. And these are the kind of issues that one needs to discuss. Because if we are going to go past the entry levels of a middle income nation, and actually I shouldn't say if, I say as we go past, as we go past being at the lower levels of being a middle income nation to a mid level of a middle income nation, that itself will be transformational. Because remember, we are just a couple of years away from becoming a $5 trillion economy, but that's just one milestone. The road ahead is to reach a $10 trillion economy, a $15 trillion economy. And as we go on that course, there will have to be changes in the way we govern ourselves to be faster, to be speedier, while retaining the accountability that a democracy retains over an authoritarian system. Uh, and while adapting our systems to be more appropriate for the kind of nation uh, that we are becoming. So I will conclude with that. Thank you.